Welcome everyone. I'm Brian Labaugh, Deputy Superintendent, and uh, I'd like to get us started on our presentation, um, just a little bit about our move to hybrid learning for the Clover Park School District. Um, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and once um, we've completed it, um, we'll get it uh, downloaded from Zoom and posted to our Return to Learning uh, website. And from there, you can take a link to our YouTube site and gain access to the um, video of the presentation. If um, you want to go back over something or if, uh, a friend of yours or uh, another person wasn't able to get in today, um, they can find on the presentation later. Next. So today, this afternoon, we're gonna go over the six stages um, of return to learning, talk a little bit about the school day, um, talk about wellness screening and what that looks like um, using uh, Skyward. Um, we're gonna talk about update on safety precautions and protocols, um, and then what to do um, around COVID reporting for students and for staff. Um, we're not gonna really do any question and answer in this session. We'll talk about that um, in the next slide or two. We'll talk about our presentation protocol. So next, you know, our success as we move to hybrid is really gonna be measured on our ability uh, to wear masks, um, appropriate hand washing, making sure that we're maintaining social distancing, following all the safety protocols and instructions. And just to rem um, remember that we're all in this together. We're all working to do our part. Um, I think also uh, we were talking a little bit about this today, about having some space and grace for, you know, things change. Um, even today, um, we got some information that didn't really change what we were going to do. Um, but new information came out today, right? So from the state, from Department of Health, from um, LNI, um, while it was good information, um, one needs to realize um, every day there is something new that comes across um, our email or our phones or what we hear in the news, and that does impact decisions that we make. But in general, um, these four bullets we have on the screen really are the things that we need to do. Make sure we're wearing our mask at all times, that we wash our hands and we maintain social distancing. And we ask that of our students as well when they return to school. Next. So I'm presenting today, Brian Lawbaugh, Deputy Superintendent, and then um, we'll be having Rick Ring, our Assistant Super uh, Business Operation Capital Projects. Tess McCartan and Megan Egan, both executive directors for elementary schools. They'll be speaking. Uh, Lori McStay and Linda Kringer, both from Human Resources, will be speaking. And then behind the scenes, I think who's moving our slides is Leanne Albright, the Director of Community Relations and Publications. And um, she uh, was monumental in getting the presentation put together and this uh, Zoom out for you. We don't have the Q&A enabled today. Um, we're asking that if you have questions that you take them to your school principal or your supervisor. Um, if you're, and see if your principal or supervisor can address them. Um, they should be able to answer most of the questions you have. If not, then they can come to one of their supervisors and ask for guidance on how to answer the questions. And then um, as we kind of see what the most commonly asked questions are, we'll develop a FAQ on that. But again, um, we're just based on time. Um, we have quite a few slides and we only have 60 minutes that we kept the Q&A off and the chat is not enabled either. Um, and so we'll ask you to take your question to your principal. Um, they have uh, had a presentation on uh, several different district notices. At the very end of the uh, presentation, I have all those notices referenced and I'll tell you how you can find those. Next. I shared this slide with the school board on Monday night. Um, we had been thinking along this line, but hadn't really put a visual together around the six stages of return to learning. And um, if you look at this document on the far left column, it talks about the number of cases per 100,000 um, in the county population over 14 days. So when we 
moved to remote learning, um, virtual learning, um, we were at the greater than 75 cases per 100,000 in July, at the late part of July, um, early part of August. What made us look at hybrid instruction is that we had, have fallen into the moderate range now. Um, even though it is going up a little bit, um, we are paying attention to that 25 to 75 cases per 100,000. When we worked with um, Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, um, part of the conversation was that we would uh, look at the Department of Health, um, State Department of Health decision tree matrix, um, which would tell us if we could do certain things, it had certain things in place, we could possibly bring small groups of kids in. And so that's what we've done. We've gone through that um, guidance and we um, developed the plans, the classroom setups, the PPE, um, how we're going to bus kids, those sorts of things. Uh, we put all those into place following all the guidance from the state and from the health departments locally and at the state level to say um, that we can move to stage four. So um, what's interesting in this presentation is we're really moving to stage four here on Monday, October 5th. Tomorrow, um, on October 1st, we're actually doing what we told the board back in August, that we would be bringing special ed students in for specialized services towards the end of the month of September. And that has come, and we are looking at October 1st, bringing in for specialized services. And that's under stage two. Um, we really started school in stage two, and we said we would bring students in for um, specialized services, and that's what we're going to do. We have now also moved to stage four for our early um, grade levels, and we'll see how that goes and if the county can stay below that um, threshold that we're in and remain in the moderate level. Back to kind of one of the earlier slides, we're all in this together, right? But um, everyone countywide, school district-wide, um, need to follow. Um, safety precautions. Next. So this is a little bit just a written word of what I said where we looked at the decision tree matrix. We're monitoring um, every day. We look at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department's um, dashboard on the number of cases per 100,000. Um, and as we move along, um, we will look at other grade le levels coming. We've published um, some dates for um, other grade levels, um, saying it's not going to be, for, be before those dates. Um, and that will progress through these six stages of learning. So back to that um, slide where we have the six stages. We're going to follow what we say on that document. Next slide. As Brian mentioned, tomorrow we'll welcome back some of our students in special education um, for services. Um, but for the stage four of hybrid re, um, return of learning, we will welcome preschool, kindergarten, and first grade students back on Monday, October 5th. Um, students in grades two, three will return Tuesday, October 13th, with Monday, October 12th being a state PD day. Our students in grades four through five will not return before November 2nd, and students in middle school and high school will not start any earlier than Monday, November 30th for this hybrid stage. Um, students returning in hybrid will attend two days of in-person instruction. Some students will attend a third day, which has been identified as Wednesdays. Next. Okay, this graphic shows the schedule for group A and group B and for our, our um, elementary students. In option one, we've tried to keep our groups similar to how they are now. So essentially most students who are referred to as the AM group will be in group A. Those in the PM group will be in group B. We do know that there may be some exceptions to this. Our students in the 100% virtual or remote will continue with a similar, similar schedule as all K-5 students are on now. So there'll be an AM group and a PM group and it will be structured the same. Um, on October 7th, K-1 teachers will meet in PLCs to determine the 
students who will attend on Wednesdays and in person instruction on Wednesdays will begin October 14th. And so as you're thinking about, and this is true of K-5 as we continue to go through this process, um, some things to think about as you think about who will return on Wednesdays. Um, your PLC group should be thinking about students who are identified as not being on grade level, students who have struggled to engage since September. Um, it's important to work with support staff, for example, our EL teachers, and also, um, it's really important to think about students who need additional support with social emotional learning. Next. So we're at a slide about special ed and I just wanted to go back. So Megan just talked about stage four, right? We're moving to stage four on October 5th. But with special ed, we are under stage two. And so starting tomorrow um, with our first day of stage two, um, and we're going to serve students through specialized services that they need that they can't get through a virtual remote way. Um, there's approximately 300 students coming to school um, and this is elementary, middle and high um, and they're coming for more like appointment based services. What I want to point out here is um, if we were to have to leave stage four we would come back to stage two and continue to serve our special ed students for their specialized services or their appointment based services. Um, the only way we would move to stage one where we're completely 100% um, virtual is if the governor were to close schools again like they did or like he did back in uh, March last year or last school year. Um, if he were to do that, we would be in stage one, but if we really move away from stage four of this hybrid, we would continue in stage two, um, where we would continue to serve our students in this um, model that we're starting tomorrow. In addition, um, we moved from stage two and skipped over stage three. In stage three, when we talked to the school board about this in August, um, was that we may be thinking about some students who are having trouble connecting to our virtual platform um, or are having difficulties working in a virtual platform and we were going to bring some additional students in um, in addition to our special ed students um, to provide them that service and if that's possible we would do that under stage three which is under moderate levels right now so just a reminder here that if we do stop hybrid instruction and we will go back to stage two and stage two includes bringing in special ed kids for specialized services in addition to um, students learning 100% virtual. So just a reminder about that. So there's a really short timeline and it does seem that way and that probably adds to some of the confusion. Um, we had always planned to bring special ed students in this week. Um, we hadn't planned that October 5th was going to be hybrid, but it just turned out that, um, that the two things coincide back to back um, in terms of week to week. So um, again, just a reminder that we were planning and we've always been under this idea of stage two and serving our special ed students in a appointment-based specialized service model. Next slide. With this um, hybrid stage four, um, we know our early childhood special ed kid students will start tomorrow as well for specialized services under stage two. Their services will expand to two days a week under hybrid, um, that's in stage four. ECAP students started under stage two remotely. Um, they have been for two weeks being served remotely uh, and they will come in under the hybrid schedule um, starting Monday under stage four. Um, there are two sessions a day for both ECAP and early childhood special ed. There's morning and afternoon groups of students. Head Start um, will start October 5th as well for in-person in -person services two days a week, just like early uh, childhood special ed and ECAP. Um, has start students also started two weeks ago uh, remotely under stage two and there's only one session a day for Head Start. Um, 
both Head Start and ECAP would move back to 100% virtual um, should we go back to stage two. Um, early childhood special ed would have some in-person specialized services under stage two if we were to move back to that. Next slide. We did a training yesterday for building administrators and school secretaries on wellness screening. Wellness screening is a new component that came live today um, in Skyward um, and that we're going to start using that uh, staff um, return or enter buildings to provide instruction. Um, instead of the check at the door, um, we're gonna ask you to do the wellness screening inside of Skyward. It's on your home page. Um, there's two questions that you answer. Um, if you answer either of those two questions with a yes, um, it'll tell you not to come to work or it will also tell a student not to come to school. We're also rolling this out for families. Uh, families will also do wellness screening through the Skyward um, application. They can access that through family access. Family access can be, um, you can get there by going to our district website um, and going to the parent tab and then under parent tab you'll see Skyward Family Access or they can download the Skyward app on their phone and then you, it's a, when you go to the main screen of Skyward you can see it there. So um, right now um, a lot of our classified staff but this is kind of changing as I'm speaking uh, have not had access to um, Skyward. We recognize that and we are um, getting classified staff put into Skyward so that they can do their wellness screening there as well. You should be, if you're a classified staff member and don't have access to Skyward, you'll be getting an email for three different, um, one of three different secretaries in the district who are doing this work for us. They'll give you a temporary password and then you go in, log in, change your password, and that's your password you use to get into Skyward. Um, again, you can, everyone can put Skyward on their phone as the Skyward app. You can use that, or you can use the um, computer. If you have access to neither of those two devices, you can come into the main office. The secretaries can check you on those two questions and enter the attestation for your wellness um, at their desk. Um, again, students are going to do this uh, for any student who's attending school on site. Um, if students are only attending school remotely or their um, day is to be at home um, and not be at school, they don't need to do the wellness screening. The wellness screening is for every student who comes on site to complete prior to coming to school that day. And every day for everybody who works on site, they need to complete the wellness check in Skyward. We understand this is all new. Um, there's a great video that shows how to do this that was developed um, for families and we'll be showing that to them later tonight and then posting that to our website. Um, and we'll also be sharing that as we send out messaging to them um, today as well. Um, it's a pretty straightforward thing. Two simple questions, all of your students, if you're um, a family member or you have a family of um, two, three, four kids, all your kids are listed on that screen and you can just go in and answer uh, the wellness questions for each of those kids. Um, we've shown um, office staff and administrators how to do different reports at the building level um, and how to um, check those um, when students arrive. But this is a new component we're running um, out um, and we'll be starting this week with wellness screening. Next slide. All right, so I want to talk about personal protection of protective equipment for staff. I'm going to start with the mask because there's been so much confusion as Brian talked about. Even as, as uh, early, early of today, uh, they've uh, issued new guidelines around it. So I'm going to back up and, and talk about safety and, and that's our paramount goal here is to make sure that our staff remain safe. Early on, we issued cloth masks for our staff. That, that guideline got changed uh, by LNI guidelines to a medium risk mass from a uh, low risk mass. That is the, the level that we're going to be issuing our mass out. So we're gonna be using what's called a KN95 medium risk mask 
or a surgical mask or a hobby mask, which is more like what you get at Home Depot when you're doing sanding and things like that. But we're issuing a KN95 to all of our staff. That will be issued on a daily basis. It is considered a disposable mask. Not everybody has to um, dispose of them every day because it, it's about the type of use you, you have it. In my case, I sit in an office a lot, so I don't necessarily wear a mask all day, so I can get multiple days out of that. The, the next level that you get into is you've heard about an N95, and this is the only time I'm gonna mention an N95 because I wanna get rid of the confusion that's out there that was created with uh, Tacoma Public Schools. N95s, there's an extreme shortage in the medical profession for those. So what LNI has done is, is told us that the alternative to that is a KN95 mask with a face shield. If you're one of the people that fall in this higher risk area, you're gonna get notification from your supervisor and or HR that you fall into this category and you'll get an email that talks about the um, requirements around that. And that includes that we're gonna give you a smock to wear as well as um, um, we're moving in the direction of giving some scrubs and things like that. The scrubs aren't here yet because they require fitting people. Um, and this is all for your safety. This is, this is so you don't have to go, go home in the same clothes or, or have clothes that are exposed to your family. So these are things that we're, we're providing to our staff. Then you get into the, and most of these people are typically our nurses and people that work with special needs students or early childhood students. So if you haven't been um, told that, you're probably not one of those people, so you, you won't be being issued that. If you have a question, speak with your supervisor. The um, students are being issued a low risk cloth mask. Um, so we are providing that. Mass will be um, also provide extra mass will be carried on the school buses in case kids show up at the bus and they don't have a have their mask they'll be issued one schools will have extras too as well as uh, if somebody loses one or whatever masks are required uh, there are exceptions for medical reasons or whatever but overall people are expected to wear their masks if you're in one of those extra uh, high risk areas, uh, higher risk areas, then um, there's also a training that uh, about how to put PPE on and stuff that's in that notice that you'll receive from HR. Um, those are typically the people, again, that are uh, working in close proximity with students for extended periods of time. And uh, they're, they're changing, changing diapering, things such as that. So, I'm gonna see deliveries of PPE started um, yesterday. So um, your SPED program started receiving some. We also are wrapping up all that today. Um, eight of the elementaries received their PPE uh, today and the remainder, remaining school elementary schools will get theirs as well as the early child learning programs tomorrow. And secondary schools will follow. Um, sometime next week. We haven't got the schedules yet out for that. Again, if you have questions, contact your COVID manager, which in almost every building except a couple high schools is your building principal. Next slide. Safety precautions. Um, I want to start by reminding everybody that everybody needs to take an active role in our safety. And this, this means everybody's going to have to be actively um, wiping things down as they move throughout the day. Um, we've provided in classrooms, meeting rooms and offices, spray bottles of disinfectant, uh, paper towels or microfiber cloths that you can wipe them down. But you can also just spray the disinfectant and allow it to dry. Um, it's about a 10 minute dry time. So throughout that day, we're asking everybody to do that. It's gonna take all of us to make sure that we keep a, a safe and healthy work environment. Custodial staff are, have been instructed to wipe down high touch areas. This is your door handles, your, your um, height areas like your handrails going up and down the stairs, just throughout the building constantly drinking fountains, um, 
restrooms. They'll be checking on those, wiping those down periodically. That, that's pretty much what the day people are going to be doing. As they, uh, the night people will be coming in doing their typical cleaning that they've always done. But then when they leave, they're actually using sprayers to spray the, the school down um, with a disinfectant. So there's a disinfectant process. Now we don't spray the entire school, but they, they do focus on a lot of the areas, high touch areas and, and the desks and things like that. Um, student manipulatives and supplies. Um, that students should be, have their individual boxes so there's no sharing of that equipment. It, um, so if you haven't received those, you need to work with your building principal on, on how that's gonna be distributed. All classrooms also have hand sanitizer uh, distributed. If you run low, um, you can request some through the office and, and that can be ordered through our uh, purchasing department. Next slide. Um, as I touched base on this, we've increased our cleaning and disinfecting um, of high touch areas, counters, sinks, and other horizontal surfaces. We've put up signage. Um, we're also providing additional signage to our uh, schools. They should get uh, in their um, PPE packet. They should have received 10 additional signs for each of the four signs that we have up related to uh, safety, hygiene, hand washing, wearing masks. Uh, water fountains. Uh, water fountains will be available for students to use as water bottle fillers. Fountains are considered high touch areas. Uh, so they are being wiped down on a regular basis. We're encouraging parents to send their uh, children to school with water bottles. And we are now adding uh, um, small paper cup dispensers. Uh, they'll start, be, start being hung next week. And we're providing a case of uh, cups to each school, most likely starting Monday or Tuesday of next week. So um, kids that don't have the water bottles, they'll have an opportunity to use a paper cup. Next slide. Six foot social distancing. Um, every classroom that has students in it should be set up with uh, for six foot um, social distancing. Um, we're going back and, and verifying all this. Our risk managers out checking on all, uh, kind of looking at all the safety plans now. We have uh, reminded the custodians to go through that. In the event you don't believe that your room's set up properly, please let us know. In cases where there's extra, uh, there's a lot of tables and chairs where they will remain, but we're putting X's or marking them off, off service so people don't use them. That's just so when we do return, we can quickly um, set up the schools. And the, honestly, we just don't have a place to store all the furniture. Uh, encourage frequent hand washing and hand sanitizer throughout the day. In the elementaries, we're opening with, uh, for meals, students are gonna, when they arrive, they'll pick up a breakfast on the way to class and they will, uh, lunch will be delivered to the classroom. So they're eating in the classroom, breakfast and lunch. There will be opportunities to go out built into the schedule that allow um, them to go out and get some outside time. Playgrounds are closed. We have been wrapping up all the uh, play equipment or taking the swings off, things like that, so they're not a, a nuisance. Um, hopefully we'll get those opened up sooner than later, but right now um, we are in uh, phase two, which does not allow us to have that open. So down the road, that will probably change. Uh, again, when you're outside, you should be looking at, um, we are required to wear a mask and practice good social distancing. Next slide. Transportation. Um, students are, are required to wear a mask on the bus. Um, we have um, provided the drivers extra mask because if they show up without one, they will have an opportunity to put one on. Buses are loaded from the back to the front and we're assigning seats with siblings uh, with the same together. Buses uh, will operate on our published schedule. Um, so if you don't know our schedule, you can go to our website and actually see what they are for your individual schools. Buses will arrive approximately 10 minutes early um, to the elementary schools prior to the um, bell time. So they have time to get their food and get to class. 
We're using uh, Z-Pass, which most elementary schools should be familiar with. It's, it's a, um, a pass that pictured ID, so we can monitor when kids get, get on and off the bus for tracking purposes. Um, there will be bus rosters will be maintained for ridership as far as well as the attestation and tracing purposes. Next slide. Food service will continue to be providing uh, the breakfast and lunches for the students that come to school, but as well as uh, the ones that are actually in your uh, virtual learning or on the off day. Um, learning they're gonna they'll be able to come and pick up their lunches as they are right now from the virtual model the, these will be distributed outside um, so it's not a disruption to the learning day inside um, students in remote learning will be able to come to school and or one of our community distribution locations we have 12 locations that we actually deliver food to as well a larger com, uh, apartment complexes primarily and um, so, and every and breakfast and lunch will be provided to all students through December as it stands right now, but we expect that to change and be carried through the duration of the COVID event. Next slide. So like Rick said, principals have been collaborating with their risk manager to develop pick up and drop off routines that are specific to each school but some mandated procedures will be in place in all schools. Um, when students arrive, bus walking or parent drop off, masks will be provided if they've lost it from the bus to the door um, and they will be expected to social distance in that space as well. Uh, if they have not done the uh, wellness check through Skyward, it, it will be rostered for the uh, welcoming team they will be separated and escorted to a screening area where they will do um, to confirm the wellness and with a temperature check. Uh, anyone who does not pass a screening or feels ill later in the day, which I'll get onto later, will be moved to a room, not the health room, but a different room separated from classmates um, until a parent or guardian can pick them up from school. And enhanced protocols um, at the schools will include minimal access to the campus by those that are not students or staff. Uh, we'll strictly enforce our district policy of staff wearing identification badges. And um, I think you went back, you went too fast. Uh, go back one, Liana. I'm not there yet. Uh, yeah, so once schools are in session for the day, exterior doors will be locked and visitors will be needed to check in at the main office, but that will be, um, we will be asked to uh, not bring in volunteers or anything like that uh, um, either. Um, and children and staff will always be wearing face coverings, except during eating, um, always during check-in, check-out, and at recess, kids can have a mask break, and that will be under the supervision of the person that's out there at recess as well. Next slide. Um, if a student does develop COVID symptoms during the school day, health staff will be notified, and a staff member will be assigned to take them out of the classroom and the student will be separated from others, again, not in the health room, and will wait with a staff member until a guardian arrives to take them home. The district uh, follows closely the health department guidance, and if a student tests positive for COVID-19, uh, they follow those steps. And so to ensure medical confidentiality, the district will not share any personally, ident personally identifiable information about the individual. Um, families of the impacted school or program will be notified and families of every, any student who's exposed will be notified by a district representative, um, not the teacher, because it will go through the district. We will follow the contact tracing with the Department of Health. And then a COVID-19 response team will conduct uh, deep cleaning at the impacted school or program location, wherever it is, um, in the event that there is a confirmed case. Next slide. Thank you, Tess. So similar to the student one, if a staff member develops two or more symptoms that cannot be attributed to another health condition during the school day, their health, they'll uh, notify health staff or their administrator. The staff member will be relieved of their job duties and directed to leave the site for self-care. The administrator will notify HR. If the staff member does test positive for COVID-19, the district will work with the health department to ensure the proper procedures are followed. 
So um, we can't, again, uh, release the identity of the individual that tested positive and family and staff of impacted school program will be notified that there was an exposure um, in the building. But specifically for people that were, I, that were impacted by it, either students or staff, they'll be notified individually. So one of the things that we do to determine exposure is we ask the question, did the employee that tested positive support physical distancing leaving at least six feet? And if less than six feet, was it for 15 minutes or more, masked or unmasked? And were the employees wearing face coverings? And did the employee practice healthy hygiene? Uh, next slide, we know the deep cleaning is the same for staff and students. Okay, so the staff member can contacts their healthcare provider to determine if testing is necessary. So um, if a staff member is tested for COVID-19, employee stays home until results are known and informs HR and their supervisor to determine the leave and next steps. Now we have experienced some people that have called uh, their healthcare provider to get a test because they, they have been exposed, but until we have a positive exposure test, a test that somebody was um, resulted in, uh, they are not testing people until it's positive. Um, how long to isolate if confirmed COVID-19? So until fever free or at for at least 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medication, employee symptoms have improved and at least 10 days have passed since the date of employee's first symptoms appeared. Next slide. How long to isolate if tested positive for COVID-19 but no symptoms? Um, at least 10 days have passed since date of employee's confirmed positive test. Employee has not had any subsequent illness. If an employee is tested outside this process, um, on the weekend you had a relative and so you just got tested, we still need to know that, uh, HR does. So remain out of work until you receive the results and um, contact HR because we need to, we have next steps for negative or positive test results. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. Next slide. So during this presentation, we um, were really speaking from a number of district notices, uh, district administrative notices that have been um, developed in the months of um, August and September, and a couple more will be coming out this week. Um, we have created on the P drive, or what's called the forms drive, um, you will have always have had access to administrative notices and they go back for several years. Within the 2020-21 folder, you'll see at the very top of the, once you open up that admin folder, all admin notices that are related to returning to school or return to learning plans, anything around COVID, um, they've all been isolated up into a separate folder for, easy, um, for you to easily locate them. Um, that was one thing we heard from people was that it's a little bit hard to find these. Um, the building principals were also provided a presentation on the notices, um, just the exact notices. Um, and they have that and have possibly shared that at school sites. Um, on this slide, I talk about all the um, notices that have been put into that folder on the P drive. On the, um, and you can go find these in that exact folder and you can read them in um, a lot more detail uh, and there's awful, often um, an attachment or a letter or a additional document that's attached to these um, and you can read those as well and oftentimes you can figure out where um, the information originated from so was it department of health was it tacoma pierce county health department ospi you know what documents are we referencing so you can see the list here uh, again, those have been moved over into a separate folder within the 2020-21 um, administrative notice folder, and you can easily locate them. Next slide. As you know, um, Superintendent Banner has been doing a weekly communication with um, families and for staff um, every week on Fridays. We will continue to do these efforts as we move forward. Um, Another good place for information is the weekly news briefs that goes out to all of our district staff. Um, there's um, often additional information in there or references to these administrative notices. Um, the return to learning site on our district website is also full of um, 
additional information, shows you schedules and different communications, links to videos that we have on our YouTube channel. Um, we ask that you go there um, and read all the information that's been presented and put together. Um, and it will be where this presentation, um, after it is um, downloaded from Zoom, um, we'll have that link um, off that website, our, our return to learning website to our YouTube video. So you should be able to watch this video or, or share it with anybody who needs to see it, who was unable to attend this session that ran from three to four or three to four, 345 today. But at this point, this concludes our presentation. Um, and we appreciate those of you who tuned in to us this afternoon. Um, make sure that anybody who wasn't able to tune in, uh, that they know where they can find this um, probably be 24 hours from now. So probably tomorrow afternoon, um, they should be able to find this recording. We appreciate your support, your ongoing support, and we look forward to students returning to campus. Thank you.